Our next panel is the Coffee House panel representing three different efforts, Coffee Strong, Under the Hood, and Clearing Barrel uh, panel. And uh, as they start to, um, well, I'll, I'll, why, don't, why don't you guys come on up? Malachi Munsey, Micah Caps Schubert, and Jerry Briggs. Joe. Joe, Joe, Joe Briggs. And I'm gonna uh, read a couple of things I have here. Uh, so um, I'll start off with Malachi. He became the manager at Under the Hood Cafe in December of 2012. Malachi grew up in the Fort, Fort Hood area, as was said earlier, and served in uh, the Texas Army National Guard for six years from June 2003 to June 2009, and served two deployments to Iraq in 04 to 5 and 06 to 7. Motivated largely by his military experience, he earned a BA in journalism from the Texas State University and makes handmade paper from military uniforms and military recruiting materials that he prints his original artwork on. In fact, do you have some of that work here? Oh, there's, some, there's some out there in the hallway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I went to Evergreen, I learned this word of talking about deconstructing things, taking them apart, which Many of us here probably uh, enjoyed that as kids, taking things apart. But when you take an active part in deconstructing military uniforms and recruiting materials and reshaping them for a positive message, eh? a healing message, I think that's awesome. Could we give them a hand on that? Uh, our, our second panelist is um, Micah Kapp Schubert. So, uh, Micah. Uh, Co-founder and current manager of the Clearing Barrel, a longtime peace and uh, justice uh, activist in Germany. Uh, Micah is a counselor with the Military Counseling Network. Um, and I'm not familiar with EV. EV? Oh, oh, that's means nonprofit. Nonprofit, which provides free, confidential, and accurate information on U.S. military regulation practices to services, service members, veterans, and their families. And she also helped build critical support for U.S. war resistors in Germany over the past 10 years, a whole decade. Big hand uh, to my guest. <laughs> Far reaching and international work going on here, folks. Global. I guess uh, this work is definitely uh, global. Uh, Joe Briggs is a GI, a rights counselor, and began working at Coffee Strong as an intern and volunteer in 2011, and is currently a senior at the Evergreen State College and will graduate with a BA in liberal arts with an emphasis in sociology. Joe currently serves on fundraising committees for the Out of the Woods Family Center and the Olympia Unitarian Universalist, Universalist Congregation and also serves as a student coordinator. Hang on. Uh, could you fill in that last part? For Common Bread, which is an interfaith uh, dialogue group at Evergreen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our, our panel, uh, to give us a story of the three different houses. And uh, you guys can decide who goes first. You were going to say? No. Just yeah. Give, 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 give them a hand. Um, so I, I think I've been pretty well introduced, but I, there's just a little bit more I want to add to, yes. to, to put into how, uh, how I came to find Under the Hood and how I came to join the military and uh, where, where sort of some of the places I come from, like why this is important to me. Uh, so I, I, I was a military brat. I was raised at Fort Campbell, Fort Bliss, and Fort Hood. Two of those are in Texas. I joined, uh, I went to high school there in Colleen, um, and my dad was in Korea because he was still in. Um, I joined when I was 17, uh, and my, my mom uh, was having some mental health issues, and it wasn't safe. And so I joined as sort of a backup plan for, for, for a life gone crazy. Um, and, and, and I felt like the military was always there as a backup to me being a military brat. It was like the other option. Um, and so I joined, um, and I went to Iraq. I was a truck driver. And um, coming back from that first tour, I had a lot of problems adjusting. Uh, and after about eight months, I had uh, tried to commit suicide, and um, I volunteered to go back because I didn't think I could, you know, do that much longer. Um, and as soon as I got there, I was like, "Oh, this is a horrible idea. Why am I here? How did I get here?" And, and uh, uh, realizing it was a bit late for me to really back out, I, I started journaling and figuring, like, "Well, if I can figure out how I got here, maybe the next time I feel like volunteering, I'll just look at this and be like, "Wow, that's a horrible idea. It was a horrible last time, and then it'll be a horrible idea again." Um, 
but um, you know, in, in those journals and through like examining some of the situations and things that I uh, uh, that I saw and and, and, and in my experiences, uh, I, I really began to feel like the the narrative that makes it back to the mainstream sort of idea of like what the military experience is was not very representative, and, and even when it was trying to represent some of the things that I saw and, and the, the experiences that I felt like were pretty common, um, at best it was done in some sort of like numbers or some sort of like cold, sort of really disconnected uh, manner. Um, and so um, I came back from that deployment, went through another little spat of depression and whatnot, and eventually I uh, just said, oh, I'm going to go work in the newspaper. Uh, somebody had to drag me in there and make me apply for the job because they knew what was good for me, apparently. Uh, and I, I thought that, like, if I could work at this newspaper there in Killeen, just outside the military base, like, if, you know, somehow I could, I could change it, change it. And, and, and uh, that was pretty naive because the military, the newspapers around the military town are pretty stuck of the military. Um, but um, while I was working at that newspaper, I was talking to a reporter from another competing newspaper um, and uh, about, about my experiences in the military and about some of these stories that I had from Iraq and how I didn't think this narrative was representative of what I viewed to be a pretty common, you know, racism, sexism, uh, just, just all these, lots of problems. And, and, and uh, well, she said, oh, I just did this story on the grand opening of this place in Killeen called Under the Hood. And that was in February 2009. She said, I think you would get along with the folks in there. And I, I went in there, <laughs> she was right. <laughs> I, I went in there and I remember I met Cindy Thomas. I met um, um, uh, two or three other active duty GIs who were involved with IVAW. And all these folks had just done a lot of work in the previous year to open it. It was the grand opening. Um, and it really amazed me how open, uh, how open and judgment-free the people were sharing their stories, and how it was okay to to be honest about it, um, and and without without worrying about hurting the army's feelings. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and they invited me to uh, uh, an IBAW event in Austin, like two weeks later, February, still February two thousand nine, um, a Winter Soldier panel in Austin. And I, I might not have heard of IBAW or VFP if not for, uh, if not through Under the Hood. But when I went to that, it was really more of the same. Like, wow, these, this is, this is real. This is like unfiltered. You know, these are these individuals' like experiences, um, and and that's really supportive, knowing that there's space for that. And. Um, you know, all my time growing up in a military town, you know, in, in military schools, uh, that wasn't, that's not the, 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 the modus, you know, like, that's not how they operate. That's not what, it, it's, it's, blew my mind. So, five years, under the hood, five years, please. Five years! <laughs> um, and at that time, you know, we had, we, we had, we had, um, Resistors and conscientious objectors and lots of actions at the gates and and and, and I think we could still do a lot of the you know, Sir no sir. We already did who's seen that right right The Aleo strut was the coffee house from 68 to 72. That was our shelter house the Aleo strut uh, Does anybody know what an Aleo strut is in military terms? It's a, it's a part, you know You're on the panel <laughs> it's, it's, it's a helicopter part it's a shock absorber on a helicopter. And so like the idea behind the naming and sort of uh, part of what it, as I understand it, what was going on was it was a place for soldiers to come and, and relieve the shock, you know? Um, and also a place for organizers and lots of other cool things going on. Um, so in the, course of, in the course of our five years, <laughs> in the course of our five years, you know, uh, We've gotten, I think we've gotten a lot more sophisticated in, in the way that we interact with our community and, 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 and our, our forward thinkingness, and it's not just like about this moment of resistance or this action at the gate. And, and so we've worked with IBAW, we've worked with VFP, uh, we've done campaigns, and this is, um, well, Operation Recovery in 2011. We, over the course of two summers, uh, we 
um, collected over 1,500 pledges from active duty service members and veterans and community members like, on the base, which was sort of stressful. <laughs> and, and, um, but 1,500, 1,500 people pledged to, to stop the deployment of traumatized troops. And, uh, you know, the idea behind that being that if you were able to stop the deployment of traumatized troops, folks on antidepressants and, 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 and with these different um, injuries, that, that there wouldn't be enough of a fighting force to fight. Um, um, we also did like hundreds of follow-ups with, 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 with people who, who signed this and we did some dozens of, of like really in-depth uh, testimonies that you know, that work is still continuing now with the release of the Fort Hood report here in a few months, which is sort of like a joint effort between Civilian Soldier Alliance, IBW under the hood, uh, the Harvard Clinic for Human Rights. Um, and so, like, that's still continuing. We also worked with March 4th and VFP to do uh, recently campaigns, uh, a, a short campaign to do outreach to, to folks deploying to Afghanistan to let them know that they don't necessarily have to deploy to Afghanistan, uh, and that was successful. We had two COs this year, they're less publicized than a lot of the earlier COs, but because, mainly because they're not getting a lot of static so long as they don't make a fuss. They're, that's our experience there anyway. Uh, this picture here is, is from a parade um, in 2012, Veterans Day. It says honor all who served there because that's sort of like, that's the language we had to use to get into the Veterans Day Parade with all the flag waving uh, yellow ribbon people. But, um, you know, we used their own language to sort of question what that, what does that mean? Like, uh, questioning uh, the ways that, you know, we treat service members and, and our communities. Does that, does that represent honor? You know, is, is, and so in the back here we've got a veteran inside of a, a, a a, a big uh, pill bottle uh, in the back of Lloyd Hurlbuff's truck, driving the parade, shaking the bottle, and trying to escape. And I was there, and, and, and the conversations that happened, like even before we, we would hand anybody anything, or before they'd necessarily see the signs or anything, like people were shouting out like lists of medications that they were on. They were like, yeah, Pregnancy, uh, Solov, Klonopin, and, and, and people were like, it's sort of disturbing in some ways how some people were like actually joking about it, but like that's how sometimes people work through things with this humor thing, it's really dark. But um, really starting uh, uh, conversations. We've also done, uh, we've, we've done more than one Veterans Day parade, um, and in many ways we've, we've come, become accepted, you know, in five years as, uh, as the other side of the story when it regards militarism. Uh, both by the community and the media in, in, in general. Um, and so last summer we uh, went underwent a lot of organizational sort of structure things and we have a new board now and we just did our first in-person board meeting. We've done so many phone calls, but our first in-person board meeting there under the hood uh, this last January. Um, and these are pictures from there. And um, we looked back in the, into the past and sort of thought about the future, and we really didn't get everything we wanted done at that meeting done, but some, there was a lot of good stuff that came out of it. We looked back and we looked forward and we thought about like how change happens, and like sort of, like, yeah, change happens regardless, but how, how does the change that we want to happen, how does that come about, and how can we work on that? And we, we, we looking at our past activities and work in the community and, and thinking about what we want to do in the future, uh, we decided that, that, that change happens mainly when we meet the needs of our community. Things like <coughs> providing referrals to, to mental health and legal resources and working with GI rights and military law task force and make sure that people know their rights. That meets the needs of the community. But also, um, by shifting the culture and creating a space for these dialogues that can't always happen in this like uh, straightforward approach, and so, um, so in some of these, some of the, some of the things that we do are really multifaceted too. Doing both shifting the culture and uh, meeting the needs of our community. Um, <coughs> one that's not on here. We do ribs and rights for the last two or three years. Every Thursday, um, since about the time Operation Recovery came on the ground, ribs and rights on Thursdays, organizing uh, popular education around GI rights and. 
uh, rights issues affecting military communities around a meal. Um, and it's not always ribs and rights. Uh, sometimes it's rice and rights. Uh, quite often it's potluck and rights, but there's no alliteration in that. So um, we also do uh, paper making workshops um, where we make paper out of uniforms and we work with uh, the Sustainable Options for Youth. It's like a truth and recruiting group down in Austin. They supply us with a whole lot of recruiting materials that go into our paper as well. Um, and uh, we also do Poetry Slam with the local Colleen Poetry Slam group. A lot of folks don't realize that Colleen is a happening poetry spot, but this group who's been around longer than under the hood has been around and we're glad to have them in our community is actually Three years ago now, I think, they took second place in nationals, uh, beating out, well, when I was at Oakland, I sort of wrote, we beat Oakland. <laughs> um, we also do art shows. Um, we've done a number of art shows in about the same amount of time, maybe two or three years that we've been doing art shows now. Um, and the images here are probably like some of the more popular ones like that would be known um, nationally beyond the Fort Hood area. Uh, IBAW Just Seeds Art Collective in Brooklyn did some joint work, and that's some of that's that represented there. Um, and so, yeah, I want to go back to the Aaliyah Strut just a second. And, and so there, was, there, were, there were a lot of coffee houses, bookstores, sort of community spaces during that era. Not all of them were necessarily uh, coffee houses, per se, but there were many more underground newspapers. There were some 250 underground newspapers, the GI newspapers, at, at that time. Ours was the, the Fatigue Press. And uh, these are a few copies that we have uh, there in the office that were donated. Um, and um, we have the same P.O. box as the old Fatigue's Press. Like, it was printed on the back, and when they told me to put a P.O. box, I was like, to ask, you know. Like, that's, that's a cool story to continue. And like, Sir of Sir is one of the first things that we show people who are interested in sort of doing some of this work. Uh, and that continuity of story really helps defeat the misconception that as a service member, it's not your place to speak up about injustice uh, or, or it's, it's not that you don't have that power. That continuity of the story is really important. And so also sort of in the spirit of like the GI newspapers, I think, um, this last October, um, Under the Hood applied for a low-power FM radio license uh, with the help of Prometheus Radio Project, Austin Airwaves, and some other community radio groups. Um, and we managed to get somebody to donate a tower and space. And, 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 and so just, just three or four weeks ago now, in J J January, we were approved by the FCC to operate. Uh, so um, hopefully, within the next 18 months, we'll be broadcasting GI rights to most of the barracks on post, both of the gates where traffic backs up. Downtown Colleen is a very underrepresented community and we're looking forward to like trying to have that voice be heard as well. Pretty much all of Colleen we're gonna reach. Just a little bit of the cove, a little bit of the heights, I don't know how your Fort Hood geography is, but it's, it's a really targeted and important community, that's our base. So um, I think I'm gonna pass it on to Micah. Like my, my hometown Hanau is right next to Frankfurt in the middle of Germany and uh, Hanau used to be um, the, the biggest um, U.S. outpost outside of the U.S. for a long, long time. Like I think like up to the mid-70s like the, there was like 148,000 um, soldiers in the Hanau garrison. So of course you, um, I always, you know, like was in, in, in touch with, with Americans and people hung out together and had beer together and things like that. So um, in 2002, like by, the, by, by mid and end 2002, when it was like really clear that Iraq is gonna happen, um, um, and I knew like a couple of friends I had, um, a soldiers stationed in, in Hanau, um, they had to go um, take part in this invasion. And I just felt so um, really helpless because I felt like I, I don't want my friends, that they, I don't want, them to go. I don't want anyone to, that that they have to do this. So I was kind of trying to find you know like there must be Americans out there, um, kind of you know like doing something, help out in one way or the other. And um, finally, like in February 2002, 
um, you probably all remember there was massive, massive demonstrations all around the world um, protesting the war and there was a um, very big blockade um, at the Frankfurt Air Base, the, Air Base um, the US Air Base was in Frankfurt in that time. So there was a big blockade and then I, I just saw like these people with this banner and it, it was saying like stop the war brigade and um, Vietnam Veterans Against the War IA, IE. Um, so I ran into the, this group of people and um, uh, met Donnell Stephen Summers and Dave Lalock, um, two guys who are also in the Cernosa movie. Um, and I think that movie really um, has inspired a, a, lot, a lot of people. And so I ran into these guys and also Dave Carson. Um, he was a conscience objector in uh, 91. Um, he lived in Hanau at that time, um, and they, they actually beat him into the plane in 91. So I ran into these veterans, and I was really totally excited, and they uh, got me in touch with the Military Counseling Network. Um, the Military Counseling Network was found, founded by um, the Mennonite Peace Committee uh, in the 80s already, um, helping um, soldiers and uh, military personnel to um, most of the time it's going for a conscience objector's status because the Mennonites, as you know, have this pacifist approach um, to um, the military. So there was this organization, um, Military Counseling Network, and that's um, actually the um, only outside branch of the GI rights hotline um, outside of the US. So I got involved with that. I was in the support group and um, yeah, did all that work. Um, in 2010, the Mennonites had to decide on to how to go on with that work because, yeah, it was a money issue also, and they um, also did a lot of Christian peacemaker team work. Um, so, like, they shifted to do like more of the Christian peacemaker team, and the, the discussion was, you know, like, um, we're gonna close this down, or what are we gonna do with that? Um, by that time, I was already uh, married to an Iraq veteran um, and um, deserter. My husband deserted in 2007 after a tour in Iraq. And we just, um, we just knew that we have to continue this work. This is so important and there's so many people out there that need help. Um, and we need to go on with that. Um, so we kind of like, um, yeah, split off from, a little bit, split off from, from the Mennonite part and, and then founded like a non-profit organization with the same name, the Military Council Network. Um, and um, also, I always had the dream of having like a cool GI coffee house, like, like the ones they had in the 60s and 70s. Um, so yeah, we decided on, yeah, let, let's do that. Let's do a coffee house. And um, to do so, we had to um, think about, you know, like if we're gonna do it, we have to do it somewhere where all the troops are. And so we had made the decision to go down to Kaiserslautern. Some of you might know Kaiserslautern by, by the name of K-Town. Um, and um, yeah, Kaiserslautern is, a, a, is the epicenter of the military um, in, still in, in Germany. Um, there's this map that it's, it's really small. Um, it's probably hard to see, but um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the um, importance of yeah, Germany as as I like to call it, Germany being the plane carrier for the wars the U.S. is launching all over the place. Um, you might think, like, what the hell are these Americans doing in Germany? You know, like, the war came down, and, um, and it seemed like, you know, like, we're over the Cold War kind of scenario. You don't have to protect us from the Russians anymore. Um, that obviously changed um, in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, Germany is still a, a very <coughs> important, strategic, important um, place um, for the U.S. military. It, it, uh, it's the headquarter of the European Command is in Wiesbaden, um, in the Rhein-Main area. And also what gets more and more important right now, it seems, is that the headquarter of the Africa Command is also in Germany. And um, like, lately we've been hearing a lot about what is going on in Africa. Um, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really um, strange, it's not really clear what, what's going on, but you just keep hearing, you know, like they send all these small special troops, special forces, 
uh, troops down there. Um, so something is going on. And um, of course, what's um, a major thing um, to make the connection to, to, to the US is um, that a lot, like all the dro drone operations in Africa are going via the um, headquarters of African Command and also um, Rammstein Air Base, that's the huge air base in the uh, Kaiserslautern area, um, is a major part in, 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 in the, in these, yeah, bases working together on, on the drone warfare. Um, supposedly there, there's not, they, they don't launch the drones from Germany, um, at least as far as we know, and also, of course, that would be a major political um, problem there with, with the German government. But um, Rammstein um, Air Base um, was the major hub for Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, right next to it is the Lanshul Medical Hospital. It's the uh, um, biggest um, uh, U.S. hospital outside of the U.S. So every everyone that was wounded in one way or the other um, had to go through Lanshul um, Hospital. So the airport was always like very important for transporting transportation of troops and material back and forth. But also now it's um, it's important for the drone operations. Um, also, what's what's going on in, in Europe um, and and Rammstein plays a major role in that. Um, you know, like I I I thought you know like when the war came down and the Cold War scenario was over, like we're finally getting rid of this East block west block conflict and um, but yeah wrong I was wrong um, the there is a new missile shield build up um, going towards the east um, so and also the, the, the headquarters for that the, the operational headquarter is also in Hamstein um, right next where we are yeah so Kaiserslautern um, Pretty small town, 90,000 people uh, plus 50,000 Americans. Not all of them military personnel, but a lot of civilian workers and family members. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty small town. Um, so, but yeah, this is the coffee house right there. That's the clearing barrel um, in the middle of K Town. Um, and also, the, the name, you, you might have recognized that the names of the co co coffee houses kind of like uh, have like a double meaning. Um, does anyone know what a clearing barrel is in military terms? Richard, please. It's where you uh, uh, get rid of your ammunition. You clear your barrel in the barrel. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a barrel, and you clear out your weapon. You, yeah, you um, unload, and this is why. I, I, yeah, my husband just said it. I have to say that it was his idea, and, and it was a good idea. Um, so yeah, it has a double meaning, and um, of course, um, we still also do the the counseling part. But because we are like the only ones doing it outside the U.S., um, a lot um, a lot of the um, the counseling goes via phone and email because of course not not everyone stationed outside the U.S. is in Kaiserslautern. Um, but um, the, the 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 main um, the main approach of the cafe is to be an open space. Everyone can come in, no matter if you're active duty or, or a veteran, or if you're a German student or a German peace activist. Um, it's just open to everyone. And um, of course, people like you walk in, and I think you like pretty quick get that this is an anti-war cafe. But also, when uh, when people when we start talking to people, um, it's pretty um, like people do re uh, recognize that if they if they want to talk, if they start to talk, they um, they can feel that we know what they're talking about, and I think this is like the most important approach. Um, also, um, just lately. Um, uh, I, me, myself, and, and, and another um, woman, uh, a German woman married to a vet veteran, um, we, we started to have like a monthly meeting. Um, and we kind of like started off with this big idea of, yeah, we have like this big group here and we, you know, like can 
go seek help from your therapist. But basically what we do is sit on the couch, have coffee and talk. And um, that's what the cafe is about. We do a lot of shows and, and that brings in a lot of young people. And also <coughs> what's, what's like really nice is that um, you know, like normally when people go to a bar, and I have to talk about the bar part here a little bit, normally when you go to a pub or a bar with your friends, you sit on one table and you just stay with your friends. But we have these nice couches all over the place and, and people just need to sit together and that's the, a lot of interaction is happening right there. Um, we also do um, uh, events, of course, um, like movie, wish, wish on movies and um, not, not only for, for the Americans, but also for the Germans coming in. So they get kind of like an idea what our work is. Because in the past it's been sometimes a little bit hard to do this work, because, especially with the German peace movement sometimes, because they were like, what? Why would we support um, working with American soldiers? They're the occupiers, you know, like they, they're the aggressors. But yeah, we, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I don't know, like, yeah, one, one thing um, that's pretty cool about Germany, um, I would say, is that we can actually, we are also a bar. You can have cake and coffee during the day and beer and what have you um, during the night. Yeah, I guess that's enough. <clears throat> well, these are both two pretty hard acts to follow up with. Um, my name is Joe Briggs, and um, I'm a GR rights counselor currently working at Coffee Strong, which is just base right near uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord, um, just north of here. And I thought before I launch into the work that I do at Coffee Strong um, uh, and the work that Coffee Strong does, um, I'd give you a little bit of my background and how I got connected to this work. Um, and kind of some of my driving forces and inspirations that drew me to the work that Coffee Strong does. So I grew up in um, central Minnesota in a fairly rural community where um, food processing and meat packing were king. Um, the, the town that I went to high school in is home to the second largest slaughterhouse after Green Bay, Wisconsin, I believe. About 500 cows are slaughtered there a day. So. Most of my high school classmates, their options were either to work at uh, Hormel Foods or the Slaughterhouse or a Walmart or some did pursue community college. Um, but uh, just below a quarter of my high school graduating class entered the Minnesota National Guard or a branch of the Armed Forces. Um, so I remain quite close with many of these friends as um, I moved to Seattle following high school, um, and many of them were in the armed forces. Um, and I saw them return home and the, the effects that the war had on them, and um, that left me with many perplexing questions. Um, I began school at Evergreen in the fall of 2010, and my first program there was a program called Visions and Voices, which was taught by Lori Meeker and Teresa Saliba, and it focused on Native American communities and the Middle East, and much of our time was spent looking at the role that the U.S. military plays in these respective communities. Um, and during that time, I also had read a book uh, called Lethal Warriors, When the New <coughs> Band of Brothers Returns Home which focuses on the military community of Colorado Springs and chronicles a group of soldiers who have been deployed uh, multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan and the impact they have there um, on the, the local community of Colorado Springs. So these um, many factors, in addition to being a Unitarian Universalist and um, seeing their commitment to social justice have kind of led me and inspired me to um, help in doing the work that Coffee Strong does. And um, in 2012, um, I ended up doing an internship contract uh, sponsored by Zoltan, who is sitting back here, um, uh, doing GI rights counseling work at Coffee Strong. 
and I've been doing that ever since. Um, and so as a GI rights counselor, I'm primarily working with uh, active duty military personnel, so I have very little contact with veterans. Most of the people I'm working and assisting are people who are currently um, in the military. And the majority of the cases that I'm currently working on with soldiers um, are involuntary separations. So as the military has begun purging its ranks, they've been forcing people out kind of against their will. So we work a lot with soldiers on those issues. A number of the soldiers I've worked with are seeking what's called a discharge upgrade. So they've been discharged with an other than honorable or a general discharge and they, they want to um, upgrade that to an honorable. Um, and one of the things that I appreciate most about Coffee Strong is we specialize in a, an approach to counseling that's called non-directive counseling. So instead of saying to a soldier, I really um, would like you to pursue this path, we kind of lay down like maybe four or five different paths and weigh those, the pros and cons of each one of those paths and really kind of leave it up to the soldier to decide which one of those paths they want to pursue. Um, and in addition to that, we also really um, try and give the soldiers that we work with the tools that they then can go and take back to other people that they know are in need and um, help those people. So we're really trying to help them become active participants within the community. Um, and I think Coffee Strong does a great job in bringing an awareness to people in the local community here and beyond of um, what the military is doing. Um, and yeah, I think those are the main things I wanted to highlight. Um, and like the other two coffee houses, we have been active in a number of outreach drives. Operation Recovery, which was a few summers ago, was a huge outreach drive that we did. And we've had concerts at Coffee Strong. Uh, we just started a few months ago a free legal clinic on Wednesday evenings um, for veterans and their families. Um, and we also have uh, to certified veterans claims agents who staff Coffee Strong on Fridays working with veterans um, and veterans benefits. So, yeah. so before we um, finish this part of the panel, uh, as you heard each other, did anything else come up for you that you would want to share? Sometimes when we pass the baton over, maybe something, oh, I wish I had said that. So are there any final words that you might want to share with us? <laughs> Starting. Uh, I, I, think, I think you pretty well covered ready for the Q&A, I think. Okay, yeah. and yourself? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that, though, by the way. Oh, you never, thank you. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we can open it up for some uh, gentle questions uh, from the group. Anybody? Anyone? Yes. I guess, I think, Megan, you, you raised something which is like the anti-war movement in Germany and the feeling about, like, <coughs> you know, there's such a separation between veterans and civilians, right? Like in this country, it's half a percent have served in the last 12, 13 years, and then another 99 and a half percent haven't. And so this disconnect serves to, like, help the war effort, right, to keep the wars going. So I'm curious, maybe if anybody in the panel can answer this, but how do you balance, like, what is three coffee houses that are founded in an anti-war ideology, but may not always like be anti-war, perhaps in all of its behavior, because it's a process of trying to be open to everybody and have and bring in people. Or can you talk about that balance and the, and the difficulty, especially as it relates to like the civilian anti-war movement? I know that's a lot, I'm sorry. But... <laughs> um, well, of course I can only speak for Germany, and of course, um, um, just like when you look at the history of Germany, of course, um, uh, the, 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 the German uh, public in general is very critical of war. Still, like right now, like uh, more than 60% are against Germany being involved in any of that. Um, the government, of course, doesn't care. But um, of course, like the, the, the traditional peace movement in Germany um, 
just comes from like a very different angle than um, a, a, the American piece in the world would be, I, I think. And um, and yeah, and, and and working like with American soldiers is like more, even more confusing to them. Why? Um, because yeah, because it, the occupiers. Um, there is, it is changing though, and um, a lot has to do with um, the the politics of the German. The, German politics are changing. Um, we don't have a draft anymore for almost two years now. So um, it's an all voluntary um, military now. And just the path uh, Germany is going, or the, the German military is going, is so much the same as I was, uh, like the American system. They recruit in schools, they recruit in unemployment offices, they run with, like, drive around with these huge trucks and la la la, it's all great, um, you know all that. Um, so actually, like, the, 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 the German peace movement, there is, it's shifting. It's shifting because they, um, meanwhile, realize it's really important to work with military people not against them because they are the ones in and they might be the ones that can stop this. Um, I just want to have like one short example. Um, like um, I just moved uh, into another apartment in, in fall and right next to me there's like this young guy and, um, uh, and um, he came into the cafe and we started talking and then he just like said like yeah I just um, I, I just uh, I was just I just finished my four years of um, um, German military service, uh, and I was like, oh, wow. Um, and he, he told me, yeah, I was um, in, in Afghanistan and somewhere in, uh, in Africa. And um, a couple of days later, I met him again, and he just came back from the unemployment office. If you're unemployed in Germany, um, you get like 67% of your wa original wage for one year. And he came back from the unemployment office and he told me this story that you know, like he got like 600 euros a month and he was wondering why I'm not getting any money. So he walked up to the um, unemployment office and talked to this person behind the counter and this person behind the counter just went like, well, what you were doing was not a real job. <laughs> so you see where, like, the, where, where it's going to, it's going down the same path and, and, and that does change the perception of the older peace movement. It has to change, and it, it will. And it's also, yeah, it's always kind of like you know, like walking the the line. Same is for you guys, I think. Yeah, um, you know, it's just like a day long conversation. Um, um, but I, th I think I think uh, I think a lot of a lot of a lot of it is thinking about things like language. You know, and I think anybody who's done truth and recruiting this is just an example. Uh, is probably run into this sort of like. I don't know very many of them that call themselves counter-recruiting anymore. They've all switched to some sort of informed recruiting or sustainable options for youth or such like that in order to uh, be in that school environment and you know, uh, provide those alternatives. And so I think, yeah, language, you know, understanding the military language, understanding the language of the local community. Um, and go back to understanding, the, the, like, trying to meet the needs of the community like, and, and, and recognizing that, 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 that those needs and the problems that, that like precipitate those needs, uh, seeing that those tie back into problems in militarism, whether or not everybody that we help sees that, like helping them through that provides an opportunity to talk about how those are actually symptoms of you know militarism in some way or another, um, and constantly. Constantly, like being being a peace activist in that community, uh, I, I I find myself very 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 often, and I don't know, you know, I'm 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 only where I'm at, and I only have my perspective there. But but for example, downsize the military. Yes, win, right, great, awesome. But but you know, being that close to the community, it's like okay, more questions, more questions, more questions. It doesn't stop there uh, because you know. My father-in-law's a contractor in the military. My dad's a contractor in the military. My brother's in the military. I'm, I'm a veteran. You're a veteran. We're all... And, and so, like, making sure that, that, that those, you know, wins or those, that, that ground that we gain isn't just really some losing ground on some other piece of it. Um, but yeah, they won't conversation. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah. 
it's really hard for me to think a whole lot about, like, at least on the ground, about, like, the non-military community anti-war movement, because, like, it's all, even if you're a civilian there, you're very much a part of the military community. Um, um, but uh, as far as collecting testimonies, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, there has been work done on that over the course of the last few years in Operation Recovery. Also, I think uh, a lot of our sort of, like, social shifting programs sort of are trying to do the same thing, but not just from, not with this label of, of, of like, anti-war or this political sort of attachment on it, like, really just speaking to the sort of human issues that, you know, uh, to, that, that, that allow the conversation to go on just a little bit longer and allow for a little bit more questions to be an asked. Um, yeah, I mean, and I'm interested to, uh, who would be interested to talk more about like how the voices there on the ground could support like, you know, uh, civilian anti-war organizing elsewhere, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you, Malachi. It just speaks to, and, and I don't mean to put you off, but it just really speaks to how much more work uh, yet is to be done. So, and what much more, but also remembering some of the work that is being done through uh, spoken word, through the art. So those stories are starting to be told and have been told. Yes? Yeah, uh, an advantage of, of doing this work outside the US was always that we had all these war resistors and a lot of CEOs and like uh, my husband, like deserters. And, and, and actually they had a, a very good possibility to speak out and they did this on, on a big scale and, and no one over here probably took notice of it. Um, we also work together with a, uh, um, an organization called Connection and they work with war resistors international. So they, there's like a lot of contact with the Riflesniks uh, in Israel and all kinds of people. Um, and the, the, the positive thing about that was that being outside of the US, we always had like a lot of press when people were standing up, US soldiers standing up and saying like, hey, I'm not going to do this shit anymore. So that is a good advantage of being outside the US. Excellent. Okay. I want to add real, real briefly, if you know of anybody who's interested in or doing any research work or like was interested in having access to testimony and like that, and, and would be interested in citing or referencing the Fort Hood report, I'd love to make those dots get connected. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman. Um, oh, you're passing it on? Well, no, I can't hear you. He's had his hand up one. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad that this subject came up because as someone who works as a volunteer at Coffee Strong, um, what I'm learning is, A, there are incredible stories <coughs> to be told. Two, the people who need to tell them are probably the least equipped, most traumatized uh, people and are the last people who, who want to sit down and tell, tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere, and, and as someone who's not military in my background, and struggling to understand, it's really frustrating to hear, the, to try to hear what's happening because the only language that we have is the freaking military, you know, law books that, that it's almost like having to become a lawyer to understand what these people are going through and what they have to grapple with. And if more could be done to work with, um, with I'm so glad, I mean, I'm so glad to hear your two stories about these other coffee houses creating the mm -hmm. spoken word and things that could get, I mean, if you could get writers or to work with soldiers where, where more of the American people could hear how easy it is to get in the military and how impossible it is almost to get out uh, without some problem getting your rights. Um, I'd just love to hear more about how we can create that, that flow of stories about what people are going through. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the moral injury piece um, and the role that you, your places serve for the soldier. I'm wondering in that step in connecting the community to being more of a healing environment, ready to hear some of the 
stories. Um, Native American and indigenous peoples have for years had that sort of circle of healing when the soldier, the warrior returns. Yes. Um, is there, are there any examples of uh, connecting to the broader community, that sense of circle that soldiers will, will feel, uh, families feel there and around the coffee house? Um, it's, it's that abyss to the, to the larger community is one that, that I think is yearning uh, to be able to provide that. But you know, there are examples of how that may have expanded uh, into the community um, at either of the other places or across. I think it's hard to generalize that because it's like very different um, if you're in Germany or in Texas or up here. It, it, it's, it's hard to generalize that. Um, or trying. <laughs> I think the conversations are starting. So each community is going to have to figure out what that looks like in each community. Uh, because each, obviously what's happening in Germany and what that ceremony, and you're talking, what I'm hearing you say is a ceremony, a rite, if you will. A rite of passage of stepping out of that and into something new. And uh, in clinical terms, we say that those passages are important. But it's always different in each community. And, uh, Michaela, uh, Micah just said it correctly that it's going to be different in that situation and also taking a look at that it's uh, the occupiers in Germany and it would look different for those people stepping out of that situation than it is in uh, Fort Hood or here in, uh, in the Northwest outside of the gates of, of the Fort Lewis. So each community is going to have to take responsibility for what that looks like and I love the example that you used. So ceremony say with, uh, with our Lakota is different than what happens with the Pueblo, which is different how that ceremony looks like with our canoe nations here. And just like we don't want to create a general one-size-fits-all situation, it's going to be different and also different for the, the veteran and how they're going to be honored. I think, I, think, I think in a lot of ways, like, and I'm not particularly, I'm vaguely familiar with these ceremonies, um, right. but I think, I, think, I think a lot of that is, is, is sort of a story of telling peace and having, having you know, having that, that moral injury, like it's not really a political issue, it's a very human sort, sort of problem. Um, and and um, I think that just having that acknowledged, is, is having that moral injury acknowledged is, is, is sort of the first step in, in addressing it. Um, and I think that a lot of that happens in storytelling. The way, the terms that I personally think about it a lot in is, is a lot of that happens in storytelling. So and the Winter and, Soldier example. Winter example. Soldier, for example, yeah. but uh, you know, like the paper making stuff, the poetry stuff, the radio stuff, any any like lit journal that we would love to put out or anything like that, or or whether it's peer counseling, just you know, people in a group who don't want to speak that loudly, you know, who just need you know, a group of people. That's storytelling, <laughs> and, and 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 so uh, providing people with as many tools because you know you can tell stories with words, you can tell towards, tell stories with pictures, you can tell stories. Mm -hmm. In so many different ways. And the more ways that you feel comfortable, the more tools that you have in your storytelling box, the more likely that's, that's going to happen. We can't make it happen, but we can try to create spaces for it to happen. And those spaces are not just there at the coffee house. And they're not, they're, yeah. They're, 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 they're out, but they're, it, you're involved with creating those spaces on the outside right, as well. Right, right. Whenever I return home to Minnesota, which is Michelle Bachman's district, so you can imagine what the politics might be like there. Um, I just, I mean, I, I often will um, tell them to watch like Grounds for Resistance, which is a great movie on Coffee Strong and the GI Rights Coffee House movement and kind of its history, or a book like Lethal Warriors. Um, but also kind of laying out the other alternatives, like you don't have to go into the military to get money for college, you could do AmeriCorps for two years. Um, and yeah, kind of laying out those other options to them, um, I think is really important. Okay. Could we have a big hand for our panel?
again, I want to thank Joe Briggs, Michaela Cap Schubert, uh, 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 Malachi Muncy, and our previous panel, which was Alan Hobus and Philip Kaplan. Again, a big hand to them.